Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everybody. This is uh, Damian Roskill, and welcome to the AppNeta Performance. Uh, the AppNeta uh, webinar on why your performance monitoring isn't working for remote locations. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, the different challenges that uh, people face or IT professionals face when they're when they're trying to do performance monitoring for remote locations. But it might be helpful to just start with a definition about what we mean by remote locations. Um, so we consider a remote location any place where um, th that company is connecting to a data center or really an application over a network, so that could be LAN, WAN, public internet, anything at all, um, where that data center or application is not housed at that location, right? So it's, it's really anywhere that IT isn't an IT still needs to see and support. So examples of this might be retail stores, hospitals, doctor's offices, banks, hotels, or any kind of branch office. Um, so that's 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 our definition. You know, we realize that you know some organizations may actually have a broader definition of remote locations, maybe just talk about multiple offices. So this will cover that as well as part of this. So before we get um, started, uh, some introductions are in order. Uh, again, my name is Damon Roscoe. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Abneta. And I'm joined by Alec from our product marketing team. We've also got Christine, say hi. Hi. Uh, helping us out with webinar logistics and queuing up your questions. And in terms of agenda, here's what we're going to be covering. I'm going to start by talking about the remote office challenge or, you know, what are um, the unique characteristics of, of managing um, IT in a remote office setting. And then I'm going to pass it to Alec for the real work, and he's going to talk about you know, what you're missing in remote offices, some best practices, and then we're going to come back together at the end and talk about how Abneta can help. From a logistics point of view, today's webinar is going to be recorded and will be sent out immediately afterwards. We're super fast at doing that. Um, so if you've missed a portion of this at the beginning or if, um, if you have to leave early, don't worry about it. We're going to be sending it out afterwards. And if you have uh, questions, uh, please interrupt us. We love being interrupted. We like to make this as interactive as possible. So just use the questions box uh, as part of GoToMeeting. So I want to start by talking about what I call the remote office puzzle. Here we go. All right. I'm responsible for supporting users in remote locations. But I'm not there, and I may not have the ability to get there without an expensive truck roll or business trip. So how do I see what I need to see? How do I solve the problem when I'm not there? And if I'm really good at my job, how do I do this proactively rather than reactively? How do I make it so that I know about problems in remote locations before I get that call from the end user um, telling me that they can't access uh, Salesforce or Office 365? And that's kind of the, the, the puzzle. And, you know, when we talk about, we're going to talk about how, you know, traditional tools really don't hold up in terms of solving this use case. But before I get into that, I, I just want to talk about a little bit on the trend side about what we're seeing here at Upnet in terms of the growth in remote offices. First of all, they're growing. Um, the numbers that we have show anywhere from 80 to 85 percent of large companies are adding remote locations for various reasons. They might be adding it to get down to that local level for a particular business. They might be adding it from an international standpoint. They might be doing it to access different specific types of talent pools, programmers, developers, or, um, or any other sort of specialized uh, group of employees. But what we do know is that it's happening, and it's happening across the board with, with large companies. Um, if anything, you know, the, the rise of the internet has obviously enabled that as well. So as organizations are scaling, you know, they're, they're no longer connecting them to sort of the traditional MPLS and then backhauling data back through their data center, um, where, you know, they might have, uh, they might want to monitor all that traffic going through a single point. Instead, what they're doing is they're deploying these remote locations using public ISVs, business class internet, 
Um, and then adding resiliency by adding a VPN or technologies like SD-WAN on top of it. The reason why they're doing that is pretty obvious. It's, it's much faster and cheaper to deploy public internet connections than to deploy the MPLS lines. Um, and then the next trend that we see happening is that application infrastructure is becoming distributed as well. And there's kind of two major buckets of that. So there's the movement from the data center into the cloud. So you're taking applications that were traditionally hosted in a data center and then moving them up to a cloud provider. Um, about two weeks ago, we saw VMware announce that they're running on AWS, which is going to allow uh, companies that are have workloads on VMware that are living in their data center to easily migrate those up to the cloud. That's a that's a really exciting um, development in terms of the the opportunity for cloud that it gives people that are on VMware. The other trend that we see happening is we see SaaS providers coming in and, you know, Gardner estimates that 85% of software next year is going to be deployed by a SaaS. So while there will still be traditional applications being deployed inside data centers, the, the vast majority of software will be coming in via an external third party. And then if we think about those SaaS providers themselves, they're distributing their applications as well, right? So if I access G Suite here in the Abneta office in Boston, or I access it from my home in Framingham 25 miles away, uh, I'm actually accessing different uh, Google infrastructure. And so as these applications are scaled up, they're being, you know, to handle millions and millions of people, they're naturally being distributed into um, smaller and smaller chunks and um, into multiple data centers. And the reason why that's relevant is that, you know, if in the past as an IT professional, you could sit there and say when somebody called up and said, you know, G Suite or Office 365 isn't working for me, well, you know, you would classically just pull up a browser, open up your computer and try and access the application. You could see if it was working, if there was a problem. But if that user is remote, even as little as you know, 10, 15 miles away, they may be accessing different infrastructure. And so you're not getting the right answer. The infrastructure that you're accessing could be up, the infrastructure that they're accessing uh, could be down. So we've got this huge growth in complexity, right? So distributed users, distributed applications, moving to the cloud and the, the bringing in of SaaS applications. And all this complexity has created a huge lack of visibility into the end user experience for IT. And yet, at the end of the day, the, these are the folks, IT ops, networks ops teams, that are responsible for performance. When a user in a remote location has a problem with Office 365, they're not calling Microsoft, they're picking up the phone and calling you. And more, and more broadly speaking, if IT and network ops teams want to be a part of the movement to the cloud, that is, the, this huge shift that's going on, they need to demonstrate that they can manage this new cloud infrastructure. And that means adopting new skills as they move from being a builder of boxes and a manager of boxes to being a broker of services. They need to help out in terms of whether it's the procurement of these, of these applications or uh, the ongoing management and SLA management. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But, this is, bottom line is that this is both an issue and an opportunity for IT and network ops teams. This lack of visibility is a big problem, particularly as the number of remote locations increases. So what was manageable at five remote locations quickly becomes completely unmanageable at 50. But with the new distributed world that we're talking about here, gathering this information can be very challenging. And it can be challenging to both gather it and to interpret it. So first and foremost, you need to be able to quickly separate application and network issues and understand how many people are being affected. And that's not easy when the application lives outside your organization. Ghost issues can be amongst the most challenging. These are the issues that come and go, right? So how many IT pros get a call from a user having uh, an issue accessing an application where they say, they start the call by saying, oh, I can't access the app. and then and then it, you're just starting to get started with the troubleshooting, and then suddenly they say, oh, it's, it's working fine now, never mind. Uh, and then they just hang up and leaving you to guess what, what the problem was. Is it one off? Is it systemic? Um, is this something that you need to be concerned about? Is this affecting other people? 
Even worse is when a user calls up and says, I had an issue yesterday, but of course they didn't file a ticket and you have no information, no ability to sort of look back in time to see what happened at that point to see again, it, was this an issue with the application? Was this an, an issue with the network that was carrying that application? How can you look back to understand what happened? And then outside of active troubleshooting, shooting, you really need to gain visibility into the performance of the, the sort of ongoing performance of vendors as opposed to just doing it on a troubleshooting basis. So, you know, thinking about that a little bit more, when we, when we with the rise of cloud, SLA compliance has become more and more important for organizations. So, you know, if you're a call center and you're dependent on a SaaS application and that, um, and that you know, let's, let's not even go into the application going down, but it's, that application becomes slow or non-performant, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to manage that? How are you going to know if that's happening? And remember that most SLAs only cover uptime, but what about performance? And if the application or network is slow, it might as well be down in terms of the impact to, to that organization. Um, I recently came across a study, it's this research from EMA that found that nearly one, a third of enterprises uh, had experienced an SLA breach of their, of their uh, WAN performance in the past year, but only about half of them were actively monitoring their SLA for compliance. So think about that for a minute. That likely means that SLA breaches are happening and no one is seeing them about 50% of the time. And again, this is an area where IT and networks ops teams can add business value to an organization in the era of cloud. Are individual business units prepared to monitor the SLA of an ISP and these cloud providers? I doubt it. They don't have the skills, they don't have the, they don't have the, um, the uh, tools, they don't have the personnel to do it. And most likely they aren't even, even thinking about it. And that is a great opportunity for IT. And then we need to just remember some other important details in addition to SLA management. So from remote locations, IT really has to keep track of SaaS providers, ISPs, public internet, and potentially a company LAN. And with the rise of SD-WAN, you're also keeping track of multiple internet connections and having to balance the usage potentially between to public internet connections or um, the public internet connection and maybe a traditional MPLS that is still in place for voice and other um, um, applications that require that kind of connection. Um, and remote locations may also be deploying their own applications without notifying or involving IT. Um, the last point I would make here is just that you've got to keep up with the sensitive applications, right? So VoIP and video, these are applications that are greatly impacted by errant application or recreational app usage. So you need to keep track of these if you're, if you're going to keep um, those business units, those executives happy. I think we've all had the case where we've, we've gotten um, a call from the CEO saying that the video conferencing system isn't working. How do you diagnose that? How do you quickly get to an answer on that? So as we enter, um, you know, this brave new world, um, I, you know, we thought it'd be helpful if we could um, show some best practices that, that we've seen across our customer base. And with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Alec to drill in on these. Alec? Great. Thanks, Damon. Uh, let me bring back the earlier graphic to talk about kind of two things, uh, the network side and the data side. Uh, so the first question I want to ask, kind of frame this question, is to, to look at which networks are in your domain uh, as an IT professional and which of those you don't, or you want to or more likely have to monitor uh, and manage in order to be successful. You know, the issue of monitoring is often an issue of just the ownership of uh, either part of the network or an app or uh, an actual device. And historically, we've had great visibility into our local networks uh, through, you know, kind of infrastructure monitoring, SNMP, stuff like that. Um, but now with the use of, you know, either data centers, hybrid cloud or SaaS apps, we've lost a lot of that detail. And so your spheres of influence likely include the, the local networks at each office, as well as the wide area network that connects them, which increasingly have optimization tools on top, like SD-WAN, uh, security through VPN tunnels, uh, delivery through MPLS, 
And at your office locations, you actually have the ever important Wi-Fi networks, which uh, often to be uh, often become the the issues that you have to look at. Uh, your your goal of remote location monitoring, though, be it an office suite or retail store, should be end-to-end -end network visibility. Uh, the reason being that you can solve issues faster if you have the larger context or kind of the bigger picture in mind. And so each network component will also have hooks to the outside world uh, that affect the performance of the network. Uh, most often this involves the number of ISPs, including uh, SLAs that you have with them or potentially something like an SD-WAN vendor. Um, but focusing on the goal of end-to-end -end network visibility, uh, let's look at kind of the, the data side of the network monitoring. Alex, we have a quick question over here uh, um, on this slide, which is, can you talk a little bit more about Wi-Fi? How, how does that come into play here? Yep. So we may not have heard that on the on the line. So the question was, can you? Yo, say yeah. It? So the question is, what how Wi-Fi fits in here, and whether you include Wi-Fi networks as part of this bigger picture and bigger problem at remote offices. Yeah, so, so Wi-Fi, as far as AppNet is concerned, is really the last hop of almost every network journey. You know, we're sitting here in a room doing a webinar where, you know, everyone but uh, our presenter is on Wi-Fi, right? I'm using Wi-Fi to connect to, you know, email, to our, uh, our kind of uh, hip chat and all of the different ways that I actually interact with people. And so if I have a problem with an app, it's most likely going to be happening through Wi-Fi. And so our devices actually monitor over Wi-Fi become a member of a Wi-Fi network just like a, uh, an employee would. And so we, we think Wi-Fi is actually part of kind of almost all of the journeys today, especially when you're dealing with SaaS apps or data from the cloud. Yeah, it's gone from being optional to being a business critical service, right? So anyway, go on. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I talked about basically the network side. I want to talk about the, the data side. Uh, so most companies have uh, some monitoring in remote office, even if it's just SNMP or, you know, collecting NetFlow data. But in order to troubleshoot user issues, you kind of need to see the end user experience monitoring. So when you get a ticket, isolating it, isolating it either in the location uh, or the frequency of its occurrence is a good step. Uh, complaints from users are often hazy. Uh, so identifying the time frame can help you uncover additional context. Uh, that you know you might not expect like congestion from a rogue backup routine, YouTube traffic, or a Google Drive sync. Um, uh, setting up active tests and, of user experience at various remote locations, uh, even just several kind of geographically distributed monitoring points or something like that, uh, that'll give you a ton of data uh, to understand what the users are seeing. And, and once you start to have a bank of data or a, basically a, a a kind of a collection of all of this data from your remote users and related networks, you can see those trends actually develop over time and, and create either baselines for, for performance for your office locations uh, or use that to then inform your decisions for setting up new ones. And so armed with that data, let's, let's get down to some of the best practices here. Uh, the first one we have is uh, to set up and plan for new locations at, at scale. Right when you're dealing with remote offices, you're you're either setting them up or you're maintaining them. And so when you're planning for scale, like in our experience, the processes around new employees or new offices doesn't often take new applications into account. So when we talk about new employees, your process probably already includes stuff like app provisioning for core apps, you know, G Suite, Workday. Uh, but we recommend building out uh, actually a capacity estimation. Uh, for each new employee. So you should also include a cost per head estimation on the subscription costs. And you know, having this documentation will enable you to plan ahead with budget when your company grows or shrinks over time. And for new offices, uh, you know, bandwidth and network topology typically r run top of mind. But with the capacity estimation in hand for employees, you can actually be more precise in your estimation based on the uh, employee departments that will inhabit the new office and allow you to benchmark uh, based on the departments that are going to be there. So we um, we recommend doing this benchmarking as kind of a, a huge part of re managing a remote office uh, because it allows comparison to offices that you already have or offices over time. Uh, we also recommend continuous monitoring, and you know that is a little 
uh, bit of our bread and butter saying that, you know, we always recommend continuous monitoring. Um, but we do this so that you can that basically across the enterprise, you can identify location specific issues faster and save troubleshooting time when Wi Fi's uh, or, or regional ISP networks are actually the culprit. So setting up alerting and packet capture scheduling can help troubleshoot uh, if these new offices have limited or, uh, which is more often the case now, no IT on site. Uh, and finally here, when we're planning for scale, uh, consider any new application traffic that might arise in the future. Uh, the main reason we recommend this is so that IT is involved or at least aware of the purchasing side. Uh, large changes are often broadcasted widely, you know, if you're switching to G Suite or bringing in a new uh, HR function. But when someone like me or my team, the marketing team, adds 10 new apps over the course of a few quarters, uh, that traffic can actually build up. So being aware of apps also allows you to be on top of the performance monitoring and alerting uh, so that when questions come in, you are uh, aware of what is traversing the network. And we've heard way too many times on demos that IT didn't even know that the app was running or that specific apps were running on their network saying, you know, we don't have a problem with something like YouTube. And then looking at our data, identifying it through usage and seeing, oh, actually, we do have that problem and we just never knew it was happening. Uh, to contextualize this, uh, these tips a little bit, um, let's look at some real data uh, from a little while back. This is the top 20 apps uh, sorted by pack account over uh, about a month of data from uh, you know our, about our 40 person Boston office. Uh, taking a quick look at the chart on top, we can see that we're, there were isolated spikes in the pack accounts from the uh, Google APIs and Google in general. Uh, and that makes sense since we're all using G Suite for you know email collaboration and all that. Um, but the spike doesn't really match our typical traffic patterns. Uh, and so having the data from a few months is great because I can actually see, uh, even if I missed it during the spike, and I can see if it's happened in the past. Um, so here, I actually know that, uh, actually, yep, great, thanks. Um, I can uh, know that through kind of drilling in with our solution that it was actually a backup uh from our vp of product uh, and he was doing this because he moved to a new laptop and we didn't know this in the at the time but going and talking to them to figure out why he had so much traffic coming from the g suite uh we could see what was happening and you know as a note this chart does only show 50 percent of the traffic because it actually isolated uh just the internal hosts so the obviously the other 50 percent is the external host that he was backing his data up to or taking it from and so um that's what we're seeing on the on the pie chart there but this is really important information because without this, I may, I may have missed that this was happening and it may actually contextualize a lot of issues that we're having uh, either through other apps or may have just uh, explained uh, some blips on the radar uh, and be able to uh, you know, alert based on traffic like this. We got a question here, Alec, which is how did we identify the user? Oh, so we actually have um, Active Directory integration. Uh, and so if you, if you want to if you want to, you can just identify the IP address, right? Like if you're using static routing or static IPs like we are in the office, then you can identify that with an external list. But you are, if you are using Active Directory, then we can just bring the username right in. Uh, and what's nice about that is you can also take a look at when they logged in and logged out of a certain computer. So if you do have something like a shared computer or a kiosk, uh, then you can see who was logged in at the time that something was happening. So it gives you that additional context. Cool. So let's let's look uh, just before we move on to at kind of that alert that we have YouTube traffic over a threshold here, uh, and this I believe is yeah this is uh, again just our Boston office. So on the far right I can see that the total traffic volume is around 80 gigabytes, uh, and that seems like a lot of YouTube traffic. But divide it over the full month uh, and the you know 40 some odd people we have here, uh, it's actually only about two videos per person per day. Uh, which, you know, from the marketing perspective, that doesn't seem too bad because we use it a lot to uh, identify uh, trends in the market. But um, the thing here is that it can add up quickly and we're also kind of assuming an even distribution, right? If any of this is skewed towards one person, that could actually take up a lot of time during a day. And if, if that YouTube traffic isn't a product demo or isn't a company explanation demo, then uh, you know, it could become something else and it could be, you know, it could be uh, baseball, it could be, it could be, you know, ESPN top 10. Uh, and that can just take a lot of productivity and time off of the radar. So um, 
Let's let's see. Um, so once you once you've actually planned for scale and, and once that's rolling around, uh, a large portion portion of the job of IT uh, is going to be you being the expert on the traffic that is sent and received on the network. So identifying what applications are causing congestion or retroactively discovering the root cause of poor app performance is crucial, right? The traditional so solution uh, to this is looking at NetFlow records, uh, JFlow, SFlow, if you're using one of the others. Um, but there are a few questions to raise that may actually limit your view. You know, if you're collecting NetFlow, are you collecting just corporate data or uh, all the internet traffic? Are you capturing it all locations? Uh, how long is the data kept and are you responsible for the storage? You know, a failure to address any of these will actually jeopardize your visibility into the historical performance of that network. Uh, and on top of that, NetFlow actually adds noticeable overhead to the network, often around, you know, somewhere around 5%. And due to the movement of uh, NetFlow records over the WAN, that, that percentage could actually increase over time. So as an actionable tip, uh, go back to your current monitoring strategy and, and quantify the traffic volume for NetFlow if you're using it today. Uh, if your network is congested and you add 5% overhead, it, it's going to make a bad problem even worse. Uh, so look at how much NetFlow traffic you have today uh, and check and see how that's going to actually scale, saying from, as Damien mentioned earlier, five locations to 50 locations or something like that. So NetFlow is also particularly bad at application identification. Uh, it's an afterthought for vendors like Cisco with NBAR2, and that means that it actually lacks actionable information. Uh, you can you can get more intelligence from this data, be, or you actually can't, sorry, uh, because it's limited to begin with. Uh, you know, app identification is not a focus for the hardware vendors. So because it was, uh, you know, basically taking resources away from the router itself. So it's going to increase overhead uh, on top of the router uh, actually doing things like routing. Uh, and you, dirt, you, heard, you heard Damien mention uh, ghost issues earlier. So that's one of the types of problems you need to solve on a week to week or even a day to day basis. Uh, but in general, knowing the applications and being able to quickly identify each of them, even if it's the first time uh, you're seeing that application, uh, it's pretty important for troubleshooting. So we actually recommend categorizing traffic in any way that you can, even if you're not using it. And categorize, classify your traffic so you know what's going on in the network, uh, and enabling alerts for those categories if you can. So it, it's just an infinitely easier to alert on uh, you know, a, a category or a classification than it is on an app. Uh, and so the alert, you know, from the AppNeta side will also alert you uh, if that 6% of network traffic is social media traffic, uh, it's better than targeting something like specific like Snapchat or Instagram, because those apps are gonna change over time, right? Some are gonna gain popularity or lose it. Uh, and finally, when it comes to prioritization, we have to talk about uh, voice over IP and video conferencing. You may need uh, to not only ensure good qual call quality with a metric like QoS, uh, but if you've also purchased SD-WAN, you can route business critical traffic to uh, you know, either a higher capacity link or a dedicated link. And what we recommend is actually to ensure that QoS monitoring makes it on the list of metrics that you track because we see ISPs routinely demote uh, DSCP values to best effort. Uh, and often it's not your main ISP, but another peer that does it uh, so I'll also throw, throw in kind of a vote for monitoring the SLA violations uh, within your ISP. So what am I suggesting here? Uh, you know, separate, net network and, separate network and app issues. You know, monitoring performance uh, on multiple fronts is really the basis of here. Monitoring uh, the apps that are being used on the network, monitoring the network path being uh, between the users and apps, and then monitor the apps themselves. Uh, in, the, in the troubleshooting process, we need to be able to rule out certain portions of the app delivery uh, path, and th that basically just allows us to narrow our focus. So if we hear Salesforce is slow, I need to know where the user is to identify congestion on the local network or the Wi-Fi network. Maybe colleagues are streaming the big event like uh, you know World Cup or uh, any of the big events that come through. Um, and if not, you know, if it's not one of those big events, then I, I need to look at the WAN uh, between uh, the office and the app to see if there's an issue with capacity loss or excessive latency. Uh, if I can't find anything there, then I need to isolate the hops of the network path that are actually in the SaaS vendors domain, so Salesforce in this case. Uh, and I can also check synthetic performance against that app to see if it's in their network or if it's actually with their app itself. So big SaaS apps are, you know, load balancing requests behind their firewall. But if I can see the hops, uh, then I can actually identify the problem is in their infrastructure at least. 
And so for business critical apps, you need all these monitoring inputs to be able to decide very quickly if an issue is uh, something you can fix or something you need to raise with a, a third party, you know, ISP, SD-WAN, or a SaaS provider. Um, so, you know, all these tips and best practices are best done in concert with each other, right? Planning for scale, identifying and prioritizing apps, and ensuring fast troubleshooting with the, the visibility into the both the network and app performance are kind of key to modern monitoring and really things that we hold dear at, here at AppNeta. Um, but this being an AppNeta webinar, uh, let's talk a little bit about our product. So, Damien? Yeah, so, so, I mean, I think Alec has done a great job here of showcasing sort of what are the necessary components uh, to monitoring uh, these remote locations. So the, to get specifically into what AppNeta does, uh, we combine the three key elements that, that we think are required in order to get a complete picture of application performance and application visibility. So that starts with usage, or as Alec was showing, the, the automatic identification of all the applications in use and who's using them. That gives you insights into which applications are being used, by whom, and how are they affecting potentially other business critical applications. And then what we do with that data is we use that to inform two forms of active testing. The first one is experience testing or synthetic web testing. This is where we um, simulate a, an end user accessing a website. So it could be somebody going to Salesforce and then running through a series of steps like login, search, create a new uh, contact record, uh, and then save them and then log out, um, simulating that experience. Um, and then the second portion of the active testing is our delivery testing, which actually tests uh, on a hop by hop basis the, the performance of the network connectivity that separates um, the user and the application. And it does this regardless of whether you control that network or not. So traditional tools will give you visibility into the networks that you own because you can access uh, the data that they that they um, have via things like SNMP and as Alec mentioned via NetFlow records. But in the in this new world, like if we look at our office here, we essentially have a line coming in, goes to a, goes to a, a router, and then gets distributed via a Wi-Fi connection. So there's just not a lot of data there to to look at. And I can't ask public internet links for data on performance. Using AppNeta, you'll be able to see that performance and then actually diagnose what's happening when a problem happens. I wrote a blog post about this a while back, but you know, when I, I came in one day and saw that there was an issue with Salesforce, and even as the chief marketing officer, not the most technical guy in the in the in the in our company, I was able to diagnose the problem within about five minutes. So uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it back. Yeah, so, yep. um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of like where we live, how we actually collect the data, you know, our, our customers place AppNeta monitoring points, either uh, virtual or physical ones at key locations. Uh, these can be, you know, offices, data centers, headquarters, or even remote sites. Uh, and each of these monitoring points collects the data uh, and then uh, it pushes that data to the AppNeta cloud for app, uh, kind of analysis, alerting, uh, reporting. Uh, and what it's actually doing is it's doing active network testing. It can do uh, active synthetic testing, and it's going to do uh, kind of uh, passive collection of 100% of, of the packets that go through the device. Uh, and this is all fail to wire within, uh, I think, microseconds at this point. So it's not going to be a single point of failure on the network. Um, but we also provide a kind of a private cloud option for organizations that require the data to stay on site. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can choose either our public cloud offering, which is, uh, you know, easy and free uh, or a private cloud and bring a box on site. One of, one of the things I would mention is just that um, our devices are amazingly easy to deploy because they come pre-configured generally. And so it's literally you don't even necessarily need an IT person on the site to, to hook it up. You can generally talk somebody through it. It's hooking up two network cables and a power cord. Yep, just telling them where to plug it is, is pretty much the most important information there. Uh, so 
as, as Damien talked about, uh, we have uh, three components of usages. The, the first one here that we'll talk about, you know, the first step for planning for scale that we talked about is kind of knowing what the current state of the network is. So usage allows us to identify what apps are in use on the network uh, and what the user experience is of those apps. Uh, so, detect, you know, we actually detect over 2,000 different applications at this point, uh, and it lets our customers break down. Uh, their end user experience by location, classification, category, app, or even host, or as Damien mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the Active Directory so you can get uh, the user itself. Uh, and this is different than NetFlow. Uh, it is better than NetFlow. It is not summarized or aggregated data. It is 100% of the packets uh, and coming directly from the devices. So it is something that, uh, you know, it's not just an ingester of NetFlow and then analytics on top of it. It's doing it uh, through our deep packet inspection, we are just miles better than where NetFlow is today. And also lacking all that overhead that we talked about, right? right. And, on all the, the and all the management as a SaaS service, yep. there's none of that NetFlow record management. Uh, so experience, uh, once you've kind of evaluated the apps that are in use, uh, you can specifically monitor the end user experience and the most critical apps uh, to monitor them over time. This allows uh, for proactive alerting of poor performance, right? If you're if you're using synthetics to go every five minutes, every ten minutes, or you know however often you want to do them as far as frequency, uh, and this kind of allows you through synthetic scripting uh, to not just get an up down notification, but to get an in depth look at what the user might see, right? Use using Selenium scripting, we can get very detailed in the milestones or the steps that a user would take, and therefore not just hit the home page, not just hit the login page, but actually load some data, find out what the experience really is. And then finally here, you know, one of AppNet's core values is showing you the application delivery path between your users and your apps or your different locations. Uh, we do this every minute with streams of packets with extremely low overhead, uh, starting with just 30 packets a minute. Uh, and if we detect an issue, we'll automatically increase the number of packets to confirm the issue. And once confirmed, kind of run a diagnostic test uh, to ping, or not to ping, uh, but to check every hop along the way, uh, and that, that's allowing you to alert on uh, any of the pieces of infrastructure that you don't own with your, within your ISP or your SaaS vendor. Uh, and you know, if, if this diagnostic is already kicked off, by the time you're alerted, we're already collecting more data to help you troubleshoot the root cause of the issue. Yeah, and I just want to comment that you know, the, our delivery component is very, very unique in the industry being able to provide you these detailed capacity metrics at on a continuous basis without using traditional network flooding is unlike anything that exists out there. So it's very, very unique. Great. Finally, yeah, if you want to see this in action, uh, you're welcome to visit at tryappneta.com. Uh, you get a walkthrough inside the product. Once the tour is complete, uh, you're, you're uh, set up in a view only mode so you can look around and see what data is available. Uh, and uh, basically just kind of uh, go through a little more in depth uh, all the different parts of the Meta platform. All right, so we're at the end of our webinar. We're running, we've run a little bit long as usual. We seem to always go over. Uh, do we have a, is there a question? Just, um, let's do a quick, if there's, if there's one question that um, I think we should answer, which is how, how we actually do the low overhead um, capture that we do that somebody was asking for just a little bit more detail. So if, can you do a quick, just a quick rundown of that? On the usage component, I'm mm -hmm. assuming? Or the true path component, yeah. The true path, the true path component. component. Oh, true path. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the way that we, I mean, the way that we're doing um, the, the testing is uh, we do it through packet drain dispersion. So uh, if you're familiar with something like Traceroute, this is different than Traceroute, um, but what it's doing is it's, it's using Traceroute early on to identify the basically to do route determination to figure out what the route is for the hops on TCP, UDP, or, IC, or ICMP. And then we're actually using um, basically packet train dispersion to send small bits of packets uh, with uh, different sizing, so different MTUs, and then also different spacings, so different dispersion values. Uh, and that's a very precise metric that we're sending. And it, it basically allows us to identify both voice and data traffic at the same time. Uh, and we'll, we'll send those out periodically uh, every minute uh, and, and use the data that comes back through either, you know, ICMP echo reply requests and things like that uh, to identify what's happening on the network, what's happening at every hop along the way. And so we can identify metrics like latency, jitter, loss, 
uh, and then also uh, the all important capacity metric that Damien was uh, talking about earlier. So we're not sending out you know a ton of packets to try to stress the network. Uh, we're using you know precise measurement and low overhead, just like a few packets a minute, uh, and only adding more packets. And, and we're still talking you know a 10x reduction of what you're used to in some other tools that are sending thousands of packets. Uh, we're still, you know, even when we're confirming an issue, it's only, a, you know, a couple hundred packets. Yeah, and TruePath is unique in that it automatically kicks off a diagnostic when it sees an issue. So when we see an issue at the lower rate, you know, that, that 30 to 50 packet rate, it's only then that we start to ramp up the, the, the testing. And that's all done automatically. And one of the things that's great, I, I mentioned earlier about ghost issues, tracking them down, how difficult they can be. Sometimes I think of the Meta Performance Manager as kind of a time machine because I can actually go back and look at all these metrics because we store them, you know, in some cases for up to a year. So it's very easy for me to go back and correlate that that end user experience problem back to that network issue. So I know we've we've run long, so I'm going to cut it off there. But uh, thanks to everybody on the line for joining, and and thanks to the folks here at Meta for helping out on the webinar. Uh, have a great afternoon.